So, good afternoon. I think I'll, I'll start. My name is Carsten Rosenniffel. I'm co-founder of EANTC, the European Advanced Networking Test Center. Actually, we're based here in Berlin, and that's uh, one of the reasons for the name of this, for the title of this presentation. So it's now 29 years and five days since, since the Berlin Wall came down. I remember it well. So uh, we're an independent test lab, just as a very brief uh, intro and propaganda, just uh, if you guys don't know, that, know us, we are not selling any hardware or software, we're not a channel partner with anybody, we're completely independent. We test with uh, vendors, manufacturers, we test with service providers, and also with large enterprises and governments, uh, agencies, and um, we have been doing only quality assurance in the network telecom sector for the last 20 years. And um, NFE is one of our areas. We do most things between layer two and layer seven. So anything where you see packets in the mobile space, in the fixed network space, that's our area. And uh, NFV, SDN are the two main areas leading towards 5G deployment, which we're actually involved in. So let me start with uh, why do we need interoperability at all? And that was one question of to Vanessa's presentation, the previous one here. Why do we need interoperability at all? You know, in the enterprise space, people don't need interoperability in most cases. Just to remind you, uh, the telecoms always want to have multi-vendor solutions because they can't afford vendor lock-ins. They don't want to have any single source issues. If something doesn't work as advertised, they have to have like a backup solution because they're actually making money with the network, so they cannot afford outages. And that's where this whole multi-vendor interoperability requirement is actually coming from. And um, so, if you look at the Etsy NFE reference model on the left side of this um, slide, you can already see uh, underlay, underlaid with this, uh, underlaid with these gray boxes, where there would be like typical uh, different vendor requirements and uh, how the service providers are trying to split up the market so that they can actually buy from different sources, different types of their infrastructure. So here you can see. Vendor one might be providing the OSS, vendor two, the orchestration, vendor three, the infrastructure, vendors four, five, six, and so on, the actual uh, applications, the virtualized network functions. Same diagram in a different uh, graphical uh, representation is from an official Etsy uh, document. It's uh, from the NFE TST007. Uh, this is a document which actually defines interoperability guidelines for NFV orchestration. And um, so typically, uh, each of these functional blocks, the FUTs, functional blocks under test, uh, functions under test are um, uh, seen as distinct units. And uh, this standard actually defines in around 100 pages how to, what kind of test cases to run, how to achieve interoperability, how to evaluate pass-fail criteria, and so on. And typically, we have like uh, three major areas. It's the orchestration, it's the uh, VNFs, it's the infrastructure. And then the VNF managers are kind of in between. Their association varies. Sometimes they're associated with uh, VNFs. Sometimes they're associated with the orchestrator, rarely. So these are the interoperability points that uh, we see. And you can already see there are like three, three uh, things that need to be tested with each other in each combination. And traditionally, when any interrupt testing was done, let's say in a router space, for example, you test like whether BGP implementation works, you have two, two entities, they are pairing, and you do many pairs, and then you get to like a two-dimensional matrix, an Excel sheet. But in the Mano case, you have a three-dimensional Excel sheet because there are three parties in each combination. It's a three-tuple, which means, of course, the number of combinations is by far larger. So that's already one indication that the traditional way of doing interrupt testing in a in a uh, static, manual way, going to the lab once a year and uh, coming back after two weeks with lots of successes, that doesn't really work well in NFE because we have way more, way more combinations. There is too much effort. We have to automate it. The other reason is that um, because things are still under development, there are way more releases. Uh, companies don't just release one software version per year. Uh, they release like maybe 10 or more, depending on the type of company, type of vendor. So that also increases the frequency of testing, another reason why automation is important. And when, when, when I talk about interoperability, most people just think interoperability means we, we plug something together, you know, like it's a, it's a plugging thing. But in fact, it's much more than plugging. 
Plugging is fine, you know, it's, it's a first mandatory requirement, but you cannot run a network with things that just plug together successfully. You need to test many, many more different things before you can actually go to production. And that's one of the reasons why service providers are not going to production at large scale yet. So there is data plane performance that needs to be tested. There is the scale of the services. There is high availability. If some component fails, there must be some sort of failover. It shouldn't just fail completely. There's the whole topic of manageability, provisioning, uh, service assurance, all of these things. And then the, the agility of the service, how can it grow and shrink and adapt to uh, different requirements. And of course, last but not least, the security aspects, which have been um, undervalued for a long time, and people are now looking at security much more closely. And so with these kind of chaotic arrows here, you can see not, not each of these uh, functional blocks is affected by each and every area, but most are affected by most. So there is a ton of testing that goes <coughs> beyond the functional interoperability. So what's the situation today? Uh, I don't know if you guys know the Gartner hype cycle. I always like this. Uh, Gartner defined a long time ago for totally different uh, technologies this hype cycle, which says whenever a new technology is introduced, it starts with a hype. You know, it's, it's triggered. There is like, everybody thinks, wow, this is going to solve all our problems. Then people, after a short while, they figure out like, oh, it's not going to solve all our issues. They're getting a little depressed. That's what they call the trough of disillusionment. And then some, of, some things die at that point, and other things continue to live, and they get to this slope of enlightenment where people can actually make money and deploy them. So now the question is, where is NFE today? So in 2013, that's like five years ago, good five years ago, uh, it started with a big bang. So a lot of operators, specifically European, North American ones, a few Asian, uh, came together and said, like, we're going to align our plans. We want to throw out all our legacy equipment. We want to deploy NFE. Wonderful. So the vendors started preparing something. Only one, two, three years later, they came up with a lot of success stories. Wow, it works, it works. We have uh, POCs running, you know, it's great, you know. There are like 30, 40 public uh, epochs only that were published through Etsy. So these were success stories. And everybody was like, wow, we're done. You know, this is, this is done. We can deploy it. And then people started to try and deploy it. And they found that although functional interoperability was achieved in these POCs, it is by far not enough. So if you want to take a picture, there are two more steps. <laughs> uh, so the industry noticed a few years back, 2016, I would say, that the scaling and the integration is way more challenging than they thought. And there is a lot of testing effort that each of the service providers were, was forced to do because nobody else did it. And now, today, we're, I would say, at the very low at the, uh, of the trough of disillusionment. So the vendors and uh, service providers are talking openly about issues and more about issues than success stories today. I came back uh, from a conference in the Netherlands a couple of weeks back, you know, one of the, the major NFE SDN conferences. And there are vendors such as Ericsson, for example, who put out slides in public which says like NFE has, um, I, I'm quoting from my memory, apologies, NFE is far behind our expectations. It doesn't really work as we hoped it would be. And I sat there and said like, wow, you know. But like in the, in the stock market, things can only go up if people understand what's going wrong. As long as everybody was saying like cheerful, you know, you can't say anything bad, uh, things could only become worse. And I'm pretty hopeful that we're reaching this bottom line right now that uh, a lot of the entities in the market on the open source side, on, and especially on the commercial side, understand much better what does it take to deploy NFV, what, what needs to be done, and um, it will hopefully be solved. I think we have a good chance with the very important application use case of 5G that there is a certain drive to get NFV done because there is no, not going to be any large-scale 5G deployment without NFV. And uh, so hopefully in two, three years, the world will look very different. At least at ENTC, we're doing our bit to support the quality assurance on the standard side and, and on the implementation side. Now, if this will not work, uh, then I would predict, you know, it's not on the slide, but uh, I would predict in three, four years, if we still have the same messy situation than today, then we will go back probably to the uh, big vendor, big supplier scheme 
so I don't want to name anybody, but uh, the big vendors in Europe, in North America, in Asia, they are going to win a lot if the interoperability problem is not solved. And that's another reason why I think the service providers are very interested in solving it. So in uh, the Etsy NFE group, there was a survey um, recently from the Network Operators Council, the NOC, from Etsy. Um, what are the main barriers and pain points? So they asked around all of the Etsy NFE operator members, and number one was uh, mission critical opera operational needs of the network, for example, service assurance and performance. So you see, the number one challenge is not the functional part, it's the performance part. A use case, a business case, can only work if one understands how much resources do I need. And if the resources for a virtualized firewall are like triple the resources, the same uh, performance can achieved on a physical, traditional network function, then there is no point of migrating, or, you know, it's much harder to justify the business case. The second point is uh, integration with the orchestrator, with the management and network orchestration, and next-gen OSS and BSS. So the integration of the management is, is also a major problem, and it's a multi-vendor challenge. Because even if one starts with a single vendor, even if one says we'll buy everything from vendor X, it'll, it'll only take one year or two years until something happens. Vendor doesn't make this product anymore. Uh, so it's why that acquires another group which has a different type of product. Um, you go to a different market where maybe the vendor sells much more expensively and you need to issue new RFP. These things happen faster than one thinks. So there is a, always a need for multi-vendor. So I don't want to go through each of these uh, topics, but you can see most of these things are actually lack of interoperability, you know, integration problems. And um, issues with VNF lifecycle management, that's also something that uh, Vanessa pointed to. There is no standard for VNF descriptors. So the lifecycle management, how to ramp up a VNF to instantiate it, sounds like a very simple task, but first you need to define the VNF characteristics in the descriptor and tell the orchestrator how to do this, and if there is no standard, that's a big source of configuration problems and misunderstandings. So, but we have been testing. You know, for five years we've been testing. You know, there are so many different groups that are testing. There is, um, there are vendor testing programs. There's testing in the open source groups. Uh, in OpenStack there has been a lot of testing, and I think that's mostly successful and done for for NFE purposes, I would say. There has been integration testing with the OpenNFE group for a long time. There have been tons of service by the POC tests. But the problem is these are mostly isolated. So the open source groups do work together, but uh, each of the vendors has their own ecosystem. They are not aligned with each other. They are often not well defined. You can't really know what does it mean if a, a vendor logo is in part of an ecosystem. What does it actually mean? And uh, the service providers, of course, are always testing isolated and confidential, and that leads to a situation where many basic tests are repeated over and over again, and few people could get to the really advanced tests. So collaboration with, be, between open source and commercial programs could be improved. There is no pipeline of testing. There's a pipeline of code integration, but people don't normally talk about pipeline of CICD testing integration. The one positive ex exception is OPNFE, and to some extent, um, Red Hat is integrating with OpenStack also in an automated way, but that's, these are kind of exceptions. The vendor programs are um, lacking transparency. Sometimes they are very simple. It's just the purpose for some of these programs, not all, uh, to just have like as many logos as possible as part of the ecosystem to simplify the sales process. Sometimes they are great, but they are only one-time efforts. So let's say in 2016, a vendor came on board. They were very thoroughly tested, but almost no single line of code is the same as in 2016. So that certification doesn't have any relevance anymore. Service providers always retest the same basics. And the business cases relate to all of these other non-functional topics that are rarely taken into account in these kind of programs. So that explains that you can test a lot, but that doesn't mean you're actually getting to the end of it. So we also need to improve the definitions. We need to expand standards for testing. We need to uh, look at the real use cases and uh, define scenarios from the use cases, not starting from the data sheets. 
So the good thing is that I think the ETSI group has been uh, one of the leading groups or the leading group to really understand this industry-wide interoperability need. Um, this is also a slide from the uh, Network Operators Council. They've said our focus area of the upcoming work of the NFV industry specification group in the next two years is going to focus a lot on interoperability testing. So I recolored this red so that everybody sees it clearly. Of course, there are many things that need to work together. But interoperability testing is at the main focus area. And uh, I think that's positive to see. Now, I tried to summarize what is the state of this multi-vendor aspect. Can I give you any insight? And can I tell you, like, OK, you can check off on data plane performance, but not on manageability or something like that? Problem is, I can't. I, um, we've run a, a number of test campaigns, and there are a few more slides on this. There is no uniform state that I can tell you. If, you, if somebody would ask me you know, in private, what do you think of this combination, MANO X, uh, VNF Y, uh, Infrastructure Z, then maybe we would have some data. But uh, overarchingly, it's very difficult to predict. So for example, data plane performance. If there is a VNF, the VNF has to be programmed efficiently. That's the, the, the start. But then the VNF needs to use the right libraries, like DPDK, for example. Then the infrastructure needs to provide support for DPDK with the right hardware. They need to have the right SRIOV support, for example. The um, orchestrator also needs to understand from the descriptor point of view what does the VNF actually want and how to encourage the, the infrastructure to provide what the VNF wants. And then there must, be lack, there must be good configuration of all of this. We've seen things fail for like days until somebody noticed, oh, you know, in this hardware flavor, you need to set the BIOS variable in a different way. And the default was set in a way that it could never work. Yeah. So even just data plane performance is one topic which is difficult to predict. So all of the uh, deployments and integration projects are not out of the box things that will work just like that. You know, you deploy, you download, uh, you're done. But uh, each of these require thorough preparation, quality assurance, integration work. And a big, the, the main problem, as so often, is the number of options. You know, there are so many gazillion options in the market. It's not that we have one hardware and one orchestrator. You know, it's the, the choices which make things difficult. So another problem that was also in the pain uh, point list was like uh, way, the way how VNFs are programmed. So one would think after five years that um, the VNF vendors have actually taken their code from the physical network function time, let's say from a physical firewall to take this example again, and they would have revamped it into a way that it's cloud native, which means it's multi-threaded, it's using microservices, it's uh, actually, it can scale up and down, it's uh, well prepared for a system which has, you know, which is an x86 system and has a lot of cores and sockets and so on. But actually, it seems not everybody has achieved this yet. So um, in this survey from the uh, NOC group, from at the NFV, 55% uh, of the respondents said that their VNFs are actually using repurposed code. So it's basically you take the code from the, from the PNF, you port it. In many cases, it was already x86 code, so there is not too much support. You need to uh, adopt it to uh, the libraries and so on. Done. And um, only less than 20% knew that their code was really cloud native. So even on the VNF implementation side, we cannot assume that uh, the application implementations are perfectly prepared. And that's only one of the components. So there is a lot of work to be done. And what's good about this is people understand how much work is done. People talk openly about it, so things can be improved. And also, there is really no way back. You know, the kind of revolution that was kicked off in 2013 for the telco industry was kind of shaky in the first one or two years. Like, mm, are people really going with that? But actually now, the service providers have invested so much, the vendors have invested so much, there is no real way back. We can't say like, oh, uh, tomorrow we'll deploy 5G with a physical 
uh, Evolved Packet Core. We'll just buy a single vendor thing, it's a huge block, you know, and it's a one vendor. That doesn't work anymore because even the architectures for 5G are already aligning with the virtualization. So these things have to be fixed. That was the reason for the other part of the title, the need to succeed. There is, there is no way to fail, really. So how are we helping? What kind of things are, what kind of interoperability testing programs do exist these days? So first, I would like to point out one thing that we participate happily in. It's uh, the Etsy NFE plug tests. I think there is also a presentation from uh, Sylvia from Etsy tomorrow, if I remember correctly, or from Pierre. Um, so there, is, uh, there are Etsy NFE plug tests, which um, provide interoperability testing campaigns. There have been three so far. Uh, since 2017. These are confidential, so they have an engineering benefit. We go there to, um, to beta test our automation platforms, to network with different uh, vendors in the space, and no results get published other than anonymous results, anonym anonymized. Um, they focus on all of the components, and it's basically um, an environment where you can register your request and then test for a few hours with any, any other partner and uh, get some, gain some knowledge out of it. The results look like this. So in the, in the left diagram, you can see that the blue line says there were so many different test sessions tested, so more than, uh, more than 1,000 test sessions in two weeks. And uh, the success level was between, uh, if I interpret this correctly, uh, 30 to 40 percent. Um, maybe it's the other way around. If I'm mistaken, then you'll hear it officially tomorrow. So basically, there is a lot of multi-vendor uh, network service interoperability testing. It has been growing between the first, the second, and the, to the third plug test. And uh, the success levels that you can see on the right-hand side are almost 100% positive for the basic uh, lifecycle management of onboarding a VNF. That is like, you know, downloading the image and uh, also the bottom three for instantiation and termination and delete. So these are things that work in most cases, but when it comes to more advanced features like related to scaling, for example, then uh, there are few, way, way fewer combinations tried and some of them also fail. And that's uh, an indicator of what I said before, that uh, when you come together for a campaign, you can only reach to a certain limit. That's, um, there is no way you can, you can test everything, even the advanced scenarios, in two weeks. That's why Etsy is now going to some sort of remote events and to have a more um, different type of event. Um, ENTC has also been involved in the new IP agency interoperability tests. The new IP agency is a not-for-profit not for organization uh, based in the US. Um, they, we have uh, vendor and service provider members. Uh, from service providers from the US, from Europe, from Asia. And uh, the goal is to close the gap between these open source programs and the service provider POCs. Um, we are publishing all results there. So uh, whenever anything is positive and working, we're publishing this, these combinations exactly. So like what was tested exactly, which combinations were successful. And then uh, vendors can also use those to uh, go to their customers. So I'm, uh, I'm showing you results from something that is very old, from 2015 to 2016, where we ran our first campaign. And the reason I'm showing these old, this old data is that the, um, some things are still valid, some things haven't changed, but also to show you how slow progress is. And OK, I can blame myself, but I think it's uh, also something where the market really just needs time to um, get to more advanced scenarios. So we had a success rate of uh, 65% in uh, 2015 and 2016, which was already good, but it was for basic um, onboarding and uh, lifecycle management. We uh, started with uh, network service testing with orchestrators in 2016 and had, um, had a number of multi-vendor combinations that actually worked for really elaborate scenarios and which we could document in detail. Um, we then had uh, like a, a major orchestrator interoperability test in 2017 last year with um, seven participants. 
And when you really want to document transparent results, of course, a lot more effort needs to go into each combination before all of the vendors are okay with publishing this because before everything has really been checked off and actually been tested and verified by the lab that has been working. So um, that was a good result, but it also was a lot of, uh, provided a lot of learnings and findings. So these um, integration efforts are always non-trivial. It's, it's not just like, okay, you uh, get one combination going, then the next combination will be easier. It's always like an uphill experience um, to integrate these three tuples with uh, different vendors. Specifically, the support for the scaling test case is varied and still varies very much. Unfortunately, there are many different types of scaling. There's manual scaling uh, in different ways. There's auto scaling in different ways. And the, the monitoring aspects, like why does something auto scale? At, on which condition does it auto scale? That's uh, what makes the differences. And that's also what uh, creates the number of different scenarios. And then the way of scaling out is also different. You can scale inside um, a virtual machine, just scale the resources. You can add um, a VM to a, virtual, to, a, to a virtual network function, or you can basically create another virtual network function aside the existing one. So these are like three different options, and then there are ad additional three different options for uh, triggering the auto scaling. So that's already a lot of testing. All of this requires automation, otherwise there's no chance to get all of the uh, conditions tested. And um, we solve this by uh, connecting to the orchestrator from the northbound, like from the OSS perspective, to trigger services, uh, to understand what's going on. And uh, unfortunately, these northbound interfaces have not been standardized yet. So for each and every orchestrator, we always have to create an adapter. That may be getting better with the Etsy Sol protocol standards, which are developed right now and uh, trialed in the plug tests. So we'll see if the market takes up on this kind of solution. If so, that will be really great and would ease our life for interoperability testing. So how do we reach multi-vendor interoperability and especially dependable performance? Um, to do this, you know, there needs to be something that people can understand and say, like, this is a, a well-defined set of tests that we trust have been executed. It's not something, you know, where you say it's a success story between vendors. It's something where you can say, like, this is relevant for my business. This is relevant for deployment. I'm going to take that result, and I trust that I do not need to repeat exact same tests again. And that's typically the case when certification comes up. So certification is exactly this kind of trust statement. So the certification should uh, reduce the testing efforts for each individual service provider, not to have to repeat everything. It should uh, speed up the deployment, because if the certification has been done before, you know, things can be deployed faster. And also improve the quality of these multi-vendor solutions, because if people get used to testing more frequently to a well-defined set of, of uh, test cases and not to something that they, they like to do at the day, then uh, their quality will improve. And um, our idea is to uh, run this certification uh, on behalf of uh, vendors um, with service providers guiding the process and uh, receiving the results and also open source projects being integrated. Because obviously certification has to take place with commercialized solutions that people deploy. So service providers rarely, you know, if you, if you take uh, AT&T and China Mobile away, rarely they really deploy white, uh, how do you say, vanilla open, stack, uh, open source solutions. So almost nobody just downloads an open source, installs it, and runs production services on it. People want to have supported stuff. Even if it's derived, in, as in most cases, derived from OpenStack, then they still want to have a supported solution, which is commercial. And, uh, but if there's anything that can be fed back to an open source project, because we find a problem that is reoccurring multiple times, then of course we need to fe provide feedback and get it solved at the source. So that's the testing integration pipeline. Um, typically, open source testing comes first. So OpenStack is the most mature part of it all. And uh, that's because they have started testing the earliest. 
Then there is a commercial ecosystem testing. You know, each vendor takes the code, branches off, adds something, you know, does their own competitive differentiation, and they test again. Then there are industry-wide test programs. That's where, for example, the new IP agency or Etsy plug tests are located. And uh, of course, in the end, there will always be operator-led individual testing. But the goal is to reduce, remove all those repetitive things, remove all the basics from the operator individual testing, to really focus on things that validate the operator's individual differentiation. So the integration level increases. You know, OpenStack is tested first, then the ecosystems, OpenStack plus a commercial orchestrator, whatever, from a single vendor maybe. The industry-wide test program tests it in a multi-vendor uh, environment. And the service provider tests the most specific individual configuration. Uh, however, the effort also increases. You know, on the left-hand side, we have only one open source code set or from each program. On the right-hand side, we have hundreds of service providers worldwide. So the more right we start testing, the more expensive it becomes for the industry. So upstreaming tests as far as possible uh, reduces the cost and the efforts. And that's exactly why service providers are even interested in these kinds of programs, because they hope to upstream things. And also, um, upstream also um, means that we can basically hand over test plans. So when we find some problems, in, uh, let's say, the new IP agency, we said, like, ah, oh, this looks like it's related to OSM or ONAP or OPNFV or OpenStack. Then we'll basically upstream test plans through standardization or through direct peering and allow those uh, projects to integrate these testing efforts there so that we don't want, won't see this kind of problems in the future. So it's kind of a, an analog, analogous um, thing to the integration, code integration pipeline. Um, so I'm introducing this testing integration pipeline. Now, what would be covered in such a certification program? Um, obviously, we're, we're basing it on the uh, interoperability testing standard. Uh, first thing that one can cover is like the two-party testing, the simple one, which is infrastructure with a VNF, just to see if the um, basic interoperability with, between OpenStack and the virtualized network function works. And the second part is the network services certification, which is a three tuple, as I mentioned in the beginning, and includes also the orchestrator. So, of course, one could think about like, oh, how, how can we integrate the OSS and the service orchestration and multi-domain orchestration? Uh, but that's, you know, yet another level of integration that uh, we'll keep for the future. Um, what, what is the part of this kind of certification framework? Uh, for, it's, of course, the primary lifecycle, software image, uh, image management, the instantiation, teardown, and the termination. So basically, basics. And one would be surprised how many problems still exist with these basics when it comes to different um, hardware attachment options, different um, uh, types of descriptors being used, and so on. Uh, more advanced tests are in this network service lifecycle management, especially the scale in and scale, oops, sorry, scale in and scale out, uh, operational status of a network service, uh, healing, and determination. And I think the most um, complex part of this is really the monitoring of the performance, which needs to be handed over in a, um, over these uh, different interfaces for a VNF. Uh, for, for an orchestrator to understand at what time should it scale out or scale in. So it needs to understand from the infrastructure management, uh, maybe is there, uh, is there too much load on the CPU? Has the, the designated maximum bandwidth been exceeded? So I need to scale out. Or the VNF maybe says, I'm really busy and I have too many sessions per instance. Please help me to scale out. And these kind of um, informations are flowing between the functional units, functional blocks, and they need to be um, tested for interoperability as well. Oops. So this is basically the focus of the um, certification we're looking at. And um, one additional aspect be beyond the functional part is, of course, the performance. And unfortunately, performance can only really be tested when the virtualized network functions are involved per application type. So when we go for performance, we can't just say like all, all VNFs are the same. 
In the normal interoperability, we say, oh, we don't care, you know, whether it's a virtual EPC, a virtual firewall, a virtual router. From, for the lifecycle management of instantiating and tearing down, they all look the same. Maybe some of them are more complex internally, okay, different descriptor, but I don't care what they're actually doing. However, for, for the performance, we need to actually look into the application layer, because otherwise there is no way to test it. For a virtual router, it's very easy, and a virtual firewall is almost like a virtual router with some limitations in, in the packets that it forwards, you know, looking at it very sim oversimplified. I can just send IP packets. But if I want to test a virtual EPC, 4G or 5G, I cannot just simply send packets to it. It just won't be ready to ex accept that. I need to, you know, register, I need to register a, um, a UE, a, a terminal. I need to set up channels and I need to define slices and so on and so on. So there is a lot of application layer uh, preparation needed. <clears throat> and then also the test cases for performance are way different because a router mostly looks at, at throughput performance. It's a data plane game to a large extent. But a route reflector already looks only at control plane. A route reflector sits there and has zero packets throughput. It only peers BGP instances. So it's almost the same implementation in a different use case, and the test cases look already very different. Uh, a session border gateway, which uh, you know recodes voice over IP or whatever, uh, has yet again very very different use cases, and and so on and so on. So there are basically these um, nine different areas of VNF types that were identified in this survey that I quoted from before from the NFE group. So most people are really concerned about the virtual EPCs and the uh, IMS parts, both parts of 4G and 5G core. So that's really where the, a lot of testing will happen in the future. There are a substantial, a, a useful number of people that uh, use also virtualization for BNGs, for broadband network gateways, um, for uh, virtualized CPE deployments in business VPNs, for deep packet inspection, firewalls, and so on. And uh, the topic of SD-WAN is also growing. So from ESDC's perspective, we're covering um, almost all of these application areas. And when we run performance tests, so far we've been doing this individually, like in single vendor environments. Mostly the reason is marketing, because uh, in a single vendor environment, we can easily review the performance and have a test plan and agree on how to execute a test and understand like if something doesn't work, work as expected, it's the problem of the vendor or, or of our test equipment, but there are only few parties. In the multi-vendor environment, performance reports in public are way more difficult because there is no pass-fail criteria. If, if a vendor comes to us and says, like, I want you to test my VNF performance, and we choose like three, four, five different infrastructures, and it works better on one than on the other infrastructure. It's kind of difficult to define like whose fault is it, you know? And uh, so multi-vendor performance testing is not only a question of doing it and taking the effort, it's also a question of how to analyze and publish the results. So that's one of the challenges and goals for 2019, uh, to expand the pure NFE interoperability uh, program also in the, into a multi-vendor performance at larger scale. And uh, in this area, we're working pretty strongly with uh, the Intel Network Builders Program, um, who are very supportive of us. We're also working with the Broadband Forum there uh, and VMware to create a lab, especially for multi-vendor performance and interoperability testing for uh, fixed network, fixed access edge network scenarios in Europe, uh, where we hope to um, support not only the mobile, but in this case, actually the fixed uh, virtual BNG and uh, other related applications. So that's uh, basically all from me for this sh short overview. And um, so if there are any questions, I think we have two, three minutes for questions. Can you switch on the microphone, please? No, not you, but the guy in the back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Try okay. again. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, about the certification you mentioned uh, in SC, um, I'm wondering what do you see about, you know, we have a OVP program in OPNFV, which is uh, doing the verification. We mm -hmm. have the, the whole tool chain to do the whole certification in an automatic way. So uh, what's your perspective on, on the OVP and uh, do you think that probably together could do the certification program in using the tools that OPNFV provide? Yes, definitely. So thanks, thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, we've been looking at the OVP program. Um, I think there had been plans for it for a while. We're happy that it seems to take off now. And um, as I said, you know, it's not about competition or anything. We're uh, definitely wanting to set up this testing pipeline. And I see the OPNFV uh, certification testing in this open source area where uh, we can base on our tests efforts basically on this uh, pre-integration, so like in this pipeline. I hope this works out and I really welcome uh, to intensify our communication with the OPNFE group. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, I think I've, I've uh, kept you long enough. Thanks very much for joining. Uh, have a great evening in, in my hometown in Berlin and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the week. Thank you.